Welcome to the Alaska State Museum. My name is Lianna Wallace. I am Ak Kwan. I am from here, the Juneau area. I come from the Big Dipper House, which is a tribal house that is located in the middle of the Juneau Indian Village. Yake Iquestatini, it is good to see you. Sani yuchat duas ak, yechnat hasati ak kwan, aya yet yet to hit. Gunas chish, thank you for sharing your time with me this morning. I wanted to go ahead and introduce our project. I want to do it in a traditional fashion. And of course, we're going to be combining it with natural, rural experience weavers. And then we're also marrying it with some science. And so all together, we'll be giving the present, the past, and the gift of sharing this knowledge with you today. I first worked at the Alaska State Museum for the last, what, five or six years. I was pretty much in the vault. <laughs> so excuse me if I'm a little bit shaky, I've been hiding. <laughs> but no, we moved all the objects from one place to another. And I have to tell you, it was quite an experience to be able to touch every artifact. When I first walked in, I introduced myself in Clinket because I know our objects are alive. I know some of them have names. And so I always made sure my hair was put in a bun so that I wouldn't leave my hair behind. And I always treated it. And if I had to, I would sing. And if I didn't know the right songs, I would bring in my recordings. I have a terabyte of recordings. And so when the objects were moving, I played the music. And when people came and they came from, their, from that clan house, I asked if they would tell the story or if they would sing the song. And so they would come and they would whisper or they would sing. And have you ever been in the vault? The acoustics. You don't need to sing very loud. The people came, we pulled out the robes, and they started to sing. And you can just hear it just spread throughout. I really loved my job, I mean, as far as putting things away, but <laughs> I really liked bringing things out, too. So, and that's how when Ellen and Andrew, um, I don't see him, where did he go? Andrew was my coworker, and so what we would do is we started to arrange the objects according to the way that we were doing the research. So we put all the beadwork in one area for someone who was a beater, all the Chilkat robes and all the material that was used for weaving because we wanted to make the vault a comfortable place for people to come in and to do research. When uh, our project came up to study the dyes, you know, Ellen was with me, she's a conservator, and we worked together on a lot of these. We discussed it and decided, yes, I want to know where these different properties came from. I want to know for sure whether Emmons' idea about how to make the black dye is the same as another recipe that was made by another. And so we started to come together with some beautiful women. And I know that um, many of them are right outside in the hall, so you can find out directly from them. One day, as we were discussing this and we were inviting everybody to come in, because we wanted to know how to go about this research. You know, should we have everybody come in and, and introduce themselves and clink it or tell their story before we took the samples? And everybody came together and they decided. We didn't tell them. Once they decided, we wrote the proposal based on what they wanted. And so, as the group continued to meet, it was decided how everybody would present, how everybody would come and approach the different robes. And we pulled out all the robes that was in the vault with their stories, with the knowledge of whatever we had about that weaver and about that robe. We didn't leave any of the stories out. The folders were open. That knowledge was shared. And then the weavers came in and they examined the robes. And if I may, in the clinket way, I'm Raven. I'm from here in Juneau. So my outer shell is, his name is Shaka Kuni. He's the third one that is from Klekwan. So he is the father of my grandmother, Bessie Vasaya. And so if I could have 
two eagles to help me hold up this robe because that's the way we would have traditionally done it. And I want to show you the process that we go through. Goodness, Cheech, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Yes, whiskey ton. Hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, I know. <laughs> Yay. Daddy and Lydia. Yes, I know. <laughs> so, before we present our, our project, I wanted to go ahead and present a chill cat robe that is from our area here in the Juneau area. So the caretaker of this robe is Fran Houston, who is right here, and she has offered to bring it in for this presentation. So you're welcome to come up afterwards and take a look at it. Thank you, thank you. And we'll just have it le left right here on the table. So when we went back and we decided, well, how were we? Yes, you have a question? I, I just wanted to state that me uh, being the caretaker of this, uh, my mother was in charge of it. Beyond, uh, before her was our grandmother. So now I'm in charge of it. This, this is uh, uh, something I keep an eye on because we, we don't want to let it out of our sight. And I just want, I'm sorry that I interrupted her, but I just wanted to state that this robe itself is 200 years old plus. Uh, so I just wanted to make that comment. Yeah, you're welcome. And so when we went through the process of not only bringing the robes out and introducing the names, because some of the robes have names, you know, our, our robes are alive. We have many stories about how the, the, the robe continues to dance, and we have stories about how they deliver us from pain sometimes just by them being placed on our shoulders. And so they are a member, they are one of our ancestors. And so my job was to deliver the traditions and to make way and to preserve and to assist all I did was to validate. If there was something that you were wondering about, I would look and see if there was something that I could do to present and give to you so that you would have the foundation to make sure that you were saying whatever you were gonna be presenting. And so in our stories, we arrived and I would come, and the reason why I had the uh, Kilowell and whiskey time, <laughs> A little bit of gush <laughs> is because when we go through the process of taking the samples for our research, we wanted to do it in the traditional fashion. And so when we would come in and we would take samples, we wanted to know where all the dyes were made, not only how, but maybe if there was by chance, we had information about this robe but another robe didn't have that much information. But with the results, we can maybe say the dyes are the same. So maybe you know, we can put this one closer to that one and we can have more experts come in and, and talk about that. And so what we did was we gathered the robes and we just took the small samples that are on the back side. And as we know, those samples are very, very valuable they're very sacred. And so we didn't just want to go snip and put them in a little bag and send them off. And so we had stories. And again, uh, there was a lot of um, food. <laughs> and there was a lot of stories. And then there was singing. And then there were gifts that were given as well. And we tried to make arrangements for the original storyteller to come in. Maybe she was the grandchild. She would say, yeah, my, my grandmother, I remember her when she was weaving this. And she would remember the song that she used to hum when she was weaving. And she would sing it for us. And she would tell us that story of what happened when that robe was being woven. And then we would go and we would ask not only permission and introduce ourselves, but we would get the opposite clan to come in. And then they would be the one to snip the little pieces that are on the back. 
it is from that, the samples that we've placed, and I will be introducing, because I didn't do this alone, by the way. <laughs> so I only do the traditional part, and I have with me my, um, if you'd like to step up, I have uh, Lily, who's going to be talking more about the actual weaving and the stories that from her experience. And then we have Dr. Tammy, Claire, I'm going to miss your middle name, Lassiter, yes. Now, she's the one that's been receiving all our little pieces of samples, and she's going to be going through and telling us how those were made. And so... Without any more ado, I'd like for you to go ahead and get started. But first, if I may give you a gift. Because one of the things that we do, not only in the collection and the proper collection of our artifacts, is we recognize that the information that you are about to share back to the community is valuable. And we need to give it proper. So with that. <laughs> And that, uh, that just, this is like, wait a minute. <laughs> I kid. <laughs> it might be tea, or it might be specimen for a perfect diet. It might be human urine. <laughs> it was so funny. At one of the meetings, Patty pulled it out of her. Oh, can I say that? Yes. We were trying to decide, you know, we were looking at the different types of urine in, in, in the dyes. And we were busy in the back of the house. And we had all these different pots. And I'm going to go ahead and if you want to share that. But, you know, we were talking about urine. And um, Patty comes out and she puts her bag down. She's serious. She's emptying out her bag. And she puts her jar down. And I said, wow, <laughs> no messing around here. But actually, it's her tea. <laughs> but no, seriously, the oh. gift. Um, there was a gentleman who collected mountain goat wool. And he gave me a piece, and I cleaned it up. And he got the mountain goat wool from Mount Juno. And we have many stories about Mount Juno. But the one with the clinket name is Antu. And that's from a very special cave that's on top of the mountain. And so the mountain goat wool is for you. Thanks. The red cedar I gathered, well, I didn't gather. It was given to me from the Lummi people. So it's fresh. Don't worry, the sap is dry. <laughs> But the wool, enough to make some earrings, is from your mom. Aww. Thanks. You're welcome. She's here with us because she's here in their little ensemble over here, too. She's always around. Yes. Wherever there are people who love her, she's here. So this is for you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. mm. If you ever get the chance to put a mountain goat uh, a robe or dance blanket made of mountain goat on your shoulders, do it. If you come in contact with one that's really made of mountain goat, do it. It's on my list of, you know, the 50,000 things I want to do as my kids get older to make a robe completely out of mountain goat. But do it. Feel the mountain goat on your shoulders. It's so good. Thank you, Liana. As you can see, I hope you're here for the Chilcat Dye Working Group. That's what we're here for. Uh, <laughs> And I'm going to check and make sure this actually works. Maybe? Does it point to this or point to the... Uh-oh. Is it an arrow or is it this thing? Uh-oh. Who's on the wall? The the thing is on the... No, that's... So that's a pointer. How do we... Uh, um, technological... Mm -mm, no. Which one is it? Do you have to turn it on? On? It is on. Off what? Oh! It's the down arrow, not the up arrow. <laughs> the only button I didn't push. Okay. Uh, goodness, cheesh. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, thank you to Ellen Carley, who's not able to be with us today. She's traveling. Um, she's the conservatory conservator here at Alaska State Museum for helping connect all of us. And Addison Field, the chief curator, for supporting this work that we've been doing. And thanks so much to Dr. 
Tammy Lassiter Clare um, and Dario Durastanti at Portland State University. And thanks to all the weavers who have volunteered their time and expertise for this project. It's been 16 months almost in the making with special gratitude to Yarrow and uh, Yaravara and Patty Fiorella and Kay Parker. And if I forgot your name for showing up so many times over the past 16 months, you guys have really been the glue that's held it together. Um, yeah, good night. We're here today to share about this ongoing project, the Chill Cat Die Working Group. We are far from done, or not quite done. Um, uh, we are a merging of art, science, and indigenous knowledge. Uh, we are a team of staff members here at Alaska State Museum, uh, Portland State University, um, interns, uh, staff, PhD candidates, and dedicated Alaskan weavers. With a five-year grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, this consortium is headquartered in the chemistry lab of Dr. Tammy Lassiter Clare at the Portland State University and includes these institutions. Cool. And? Since middle of 2017, we Alaskan weavers with Ellen Carley have been collecting samples, taking inventory of the known historic and contemporary dyes typically used, like hemlock bark, um, wolf moss, human urine that looks like tea, um, <laughs> and uh, all through studying oral history and literature review, as well as like pulling the minds of all of us who are still living, or like the, the dye book that my mother put together, so we were pulling samples from there. Uh, Clarissa Rizal, thank you from the ethereal realm for still helping us learn. And we're also experimenting with contemporary dye techniques. So we've I think we've sent you some Kool-Aid samples and things that are not necessarily natural dyes because we're setting up this database, right? We've died twice as a group, and I think I'm not catching up with my pieces here. Oh, look at this. Um, we've died t twice as a group, and I taught a natural dyes class here at the university in Juneau. Uh, we brought in samples from dye classes over the last few decades. So we procure these dye samples and um, send them down to Tammy and her team at the Portland State University, and they're setting up a baseline to develop the analysis techniques for traditional and contemporary Chilkat dyes. Ooh, for those of us who are unfamiliar, and it seems that many of us know about this, but I wanted to touch briefly, mostly for those who get to watch this film later and may not know, um, Chilkat dancing blankets originated here on the northwest coast of Alaska more than 200 years ago. These textiles record Clinket, Haida, and Simshian histories, clan stories, and often dreams. The word Chilkat refers to a place of creation, not the people necessarily who weave them. The Indian village of Klukwan is nestled in the Chilkat Valley and is the rebirthing place of Chilkat weaving. I've had so many tourists and other visitors ask me, ask me, oh, you're a Chilkat weaver? Does that mean you are the Chilkat people? And I have to reiterate over that we are not a Chilkat people. We are Klinkat, we are Haida, we're Simshian, and all of us weave the Chilkat blanket. Visually, these robes are modifications of Northwest Coast uh, formline art using ovoids, split U-shapes, circles, and distinctive faces. And here you can see the distinction between Chilkat weaving, on the left, of course, and Raven's Tail weaving, an earlier woolen textile created here, also in the Northwest Coast, with geometric designs, often utilizing basketry patterns. Indigenous tribes still use our Chilkat blankets, or some call them dancing blankets or robes. Those are all interchangeable. We use them in ceremony, bestowing honor to the owners and the wearers. The robes are sometimes cut up into pieces to share the wealth, to show wealth and many high caste persons. If we cut those up, we share the wealth among many, right? These blankets take upwards of one to three years to weave with 1,500 to 3,000 hours per robe. Our studies with the Chilkat Dye Working Group hold some weight. Using oral and written history at any given time, we've had less than 12 weavers of Chilkat blankets. Ethnographer George Emmons said it in the late 1900s. And then Jenny Clanat, the last master Chilkat weaver out of Klukwan, talked about it again during her last workshop in 1985, that fewer than a dozen robe weavers remain. Hundreds now know how to weave Chilkat, but so few take on the immense project of weaving a Chilkat robe. 
Our cohort of weavers and learners include four or five Chilkat blanket makers. We weavers in the Chilkat Dye Working Group are fascinated by the natural dyes used in the last 200 years. We are keen to find dyes that might give similar colors, but stay light fast. Our long-term hope is that this dye research, in this dye research, is the possibility of attributing geographic locations of creation, maybe the weaver herself, or dates of creation. We're looking for patterns to help support clans, families, and other museums in discovery. We aim to connect this research with an upcoming exhibition here um, in summer 2020, here in the Alaska State Museum, and maybe some public programming. I'm gonna pass it now to uh, Dr. Tammy lassiter Clare of Portland State University to share about phase two, where she and the chemists are coming up with the database, of compiling that database of dyes, and have already begun uh, analyzing some of the samples in old robes. If you can't tell, we're so excited about this work. It's truly my pleasure to be involved in this project, and I wanted to acknowledge all of the uh, people in the in the Chilkat uh, Dye Working Group, and so if you happen to be here, and um, and and you're not Liana or Lily, whom you all know already, if you could stand up, um, because I would like to put face to name, um, Marcia Steer, uh, Kayfield Parker, Dorica Jackson, Irene Lamp, Deanna Lamp. Patty Fiorella, Della Cheney, Deb Ogara, Nico Sanguinetti, and Marianne Park. Thank you all so much uh, for your participation and for your sampling. And it was really wonderful to hear from Liana the stories of exactly how the sampling was done. Um, and Ellen Carley cannot be here today. She has another engagement. When these samples arrive in my lab, um, the student, the graduate student, uh, who primarily works on this project is Dario Durastanti. So as you know, our goal is to identify the dyes used in Chilkat blankets, and if there's any other information that we can learn about them that might help their attribution in terms of uh, similarities in, in the dye recipes, or if we can learn anything more that might attribute them to the same weaver, perhaps. Uh, so our workflow goes like this. Uh, so we receive the uh, reference samples. And so the Chilkat Dye Working Group sends, started by sending us reference samples. So these are samples uh, that they know the recipe for which they have dyed those fibers, and they provide those to us. And from that, we build up our reference database. So we analyze them and build up our reference database, which is a digital database. And then from that digital database, we then will analyze uh, fibers from actual robes. So the very valuable fibers that come from actual robes. Um, and then we want to relate those two findings to each other. So to be able to attribute the um, dyes in the in the robes where we have unknown recipes to a reference database and of course um, disseminate our findings uh, through um, presentations publications uh, uh, museum didactic uh, displays so now I'm going to turn to chemistry for a little bit and talk about what makes a good dye um, so first the obvious is color. It has to be a colored material. Um, dyes also need to be soluble under, under certain conditions. So things uh, that like minerals, rocks, would not be um, good dyes. They also need to be retained onto the fiber in some way. So they need to stick very well. And ideally, dyes should be uh, resistive to uh, washing, rubbing, and light exposure. And so as Lily and Liana have, have shared and, and you know as well the hundreds or thousands of hours it takes to complete um, a Chilkat blanket, weavers really want to make sure that the dyes that they're working with are going to be light fast and so as they complete the blanket that there's not a change in color from the start to the end. And so uh, so this is the challenge. Uh, what makes a good dye and, and, um, and how can we identify what those good dyes are? So the properties of a good dye that make the 
the chromophore actually stick to the fiber are, are different from the process that, by which we need to analyze them. So to analyze the dyes, we need to wash that chromophore, the colored component, off of the fiber, which is not easy to do with a good dye. You want the dye to stick to the fiber and not come off. So this is uh, part of the challenge. Now, more chemistry. <laughs> OK, so up here, um, this is the molecular structure of wool. It's a protein. And this particular bond is the amide bond. And this is a repeating unit throughout um, this molecule. So this is, a, and, and down here is a scanning electron microscope of wool. And, it's, and so you can see it has this kind of um, uh, structure uh, like this. Uh, so the next step in the dyeing process is to take that uh, wool fiber and um, mix it with a mordant. And so one type of mordant um, is an iron salt. And so you can see iron, the chemical sy symbol for iron is Fe, and that's right here. And so iron interacts with this amide group in, uh, in certain ways. And so you can see the F SEM image has changed a little bit where you have some chunks of iron um, that are sticking together. And of course, there's a lot more iron that we can't see that's all throughout. And then the next step is to, um, with that mordanted wool, add in a colored um, component. And you'll see this is the colored component. Most, one of the common features of, of chromophores is they have a ring structure like this. And uh, the chemicals, the, the way that the electrons um, interact give it um, that color. So having these rings um, is, is a feature that you see in both natural and synthetic dyes. So you mix in that uh, dye component. And the dye component interacts with the mordant itself. And so the dye wouldn't bind very well to the fiber without that intermediary um, of the mordant there. So that's the purpose of the mordant, to help the dye stick to the fibers. So the first steps that um, when, when the project um, was proposed by Ellen and, um, and her uh, colleagues was to have a conversation about, uh, well, what do you know about these, these dyes? Um, and then also to familiarize ourselves with the literature that, that's existing. And so one of the um, earliest or possibly the earliest written document um, is from the late uh, 19th century ethnographer uh, George Emmons who wrote Field Notes in 1891. Um, in that, uh, he provided a, um, information that, that he believed uh, to be true. However, it has come up later on that some of this information has been disputed. So more about that in, in a little bit. Um, but so what are the um, possible uh, yellow dye components? And so you, as you see in the Chilkat style, the, the colors that are used are the undyed wool, then there's yellow, a bluish green, and also a brownish black. So starting with the yellow, what are the possible dye components for, of local sources? Um, so this list is not exhaustive, but, um, but it has uh, some um, likely suspects. So fireweed, yarrow, wolf moss, goldenrod, alder bark, onion skin, dandelions, rhododendrons, and lilies. And so for the browns and blacks, it is quite likely that um, weavers used uh, western hemlock bark that was then mixed with a mordant. And the identity of the mordant is not entirely clear. Uh, some sources say that um, people utilized the soil at the base of uh, hemlock trees um, because the, that soil was enriched in iron. And so the, the, the um, one of the reasons why soil is brown is because it has iron in it. So if you think of uh, rust, you know that rust is a, a reddish brown color. So that's one of the sources. And so why would soil at the base of a tree be enriched in iron? Well, it's probably by depletion, by subtraction, so that the tree itself um, takes up some of the organic components and leaves um, more iron at the base of the tree. And it is also known that when you extract um, dyes from western hemlock bark and mix it with a, um, a mordant, the color changes from a darker brown to black. Um, however, 
iron mordants cause the fibers to be brittle. And so this is a negative consequence of the use of that dye is that for in, in some cases, the blankets um, that are thought to be uh, uh, dyed with that, the fibers are actually breaking and cracking. So the blue-green dyes, um, there's actually a debate, an ongoing debate about this still. So remember Emmons, um, he said in his field notes that the blue-green was obtained from an oxide of copper that was boiled in urine and then afterwards was washed and dried. And so urine was probably the mordant. Later on, aside from Emmons, um, when he wrote his field notes in, in 1891, um, Cheryl Samuel uh, wrote a book called The Chilcat um, Dancing Blanket in 1982, and Frederica uh, de Laguna uh, wrote The Klingit Indians in 1991. And so they have uh, reinterpreted Emmons's field notes, and they think that there are some um, inconsistencies into what he said and, and what was actually practiced. So then what they said is the older yellow-green color was apparently produced by first boiling the wool in a copper urine bath, producing an olive green color, and then over dyeing it in wolf moss yellow bath to get the desired yellow green. While all of the older samples of Klingit blankets tested positive for copper, the more recent ones with Chilcat blue had no copper. And so uh, Cheryl Samuel um, then read those notes and um, said uh, that this color, the blue-green color, came from uh, trade wools, from blue blankets, uh, maybe from ships. And so boiling the wool uh, with pieces of the blankets and so um, worked out that robin's egg blue um, was produced by then over dyeing that um, blue blanket with yellow wolf moss. Um, Emmons also offered some alternative explanations. Oops. Um, here. Okay. So again, offering um, the 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 navy um, blanket as a possibility as well. So whether or not the blue-green came from the over dyeing of wolf moss, wolf moss on top of um, indigo or whether copper was involved or not is the, is the uh, debate here. And so thanks um, to the uh, weaving group, we have obtained uh, reference samples that have been dyed in a number of different ways. And so this is one of the very valuable things that the weaving group is able to do is provide us with these samples um, that, that are, um, have full descriptions for how they've, they have been produced. So for example, um, here one and two, this is a copper ammonia. Um, and so ammonia being a component of urine. And, um, and then uh, down here, um, here's faded indigo um, with a wolf moss over dye. And as well, um, here's the faded indigo with the wolf moss over dye and a synthetic dye from Lanaset Green and Lanaset Blue. So Lanaset is a, a company that sells some synthetic dyes. So uh, why would uh, the weavers have turned to synthetic dyes away from natural materials? Well, again, uh, for those who are weaving, they really want their uh, work to be light fast and to, to last as long as possible. And so the synthetic dyes might offer that possibility or might not. So common synthetic um, dyes are acid dyes. Um, there's a mordant that um, chemically, they are commonly anthroquinones. Um, this is the most common dye classification for wools. There are other dye types um, like azo dyes and aniline dyes. These are less commonly used on wools, but they could have been used. And as I said before, two of the commercial names are Lanaset and Cushing's. And so we're looking to see if we can find traces of those dyes as well. So the set that the weaving group has provided with us has a number of raw materials, so including uh, yarrow, uh, hemlock bark, wolf moss. And this set can, includes both naturally and commercially dyed reference wools. And then we also have um, liquid dyes in some cases, and we have uh, mordants like urine. 
um, and Alaskan rainwater um, to see if there's there are traces of other um, things in the rainwater. The set includes um, unknown dyed fibers as well, so uh, fibers that we don't know the origin, and then samples from robes too. So I wanted to touch briefly be, um, before I talk about the instrumentation and how we're analyzing to talk about the ethical responsibilities of the analyst because this is really important, um, not coming from this area myself. Um, one of the things that is most um, prescient in my mind is that we want to maximize the amount of information that we can get from a single analysis. Um, and so the reason why this is important is because we want to minimize the sample size. And so we want to make sure that our analysis, that our analysis can be completed with a sample that is no, longer, no larger than three to four eyelashes worth. Um, and then, as you saw in the Emmons text from 1891, um, perhaps that information wasn't correct or was incomplete. And so it's also really important for the analysis that my lab does um, to be scrutinized by others to go through a peer review process. And this is to avoid, to avoid uh, misinterpretation. So I hope that the um, Chilcat uh, dye weaving group will help um, place the, the work into context and would uh, review that content as well. And then the analytical uh, results uh, should be peer reviewed um, by other chemists who do dye analysis. And another ethical responsibility is to disseminate the findings. So for us to have this information does no one any good. We want to be able to um, share it widely. And so as I said, our, our, some of our immediate plans are to disseminate through exhibition materials and hopefully at celebration uh, next June. So now how do we analyze um, the dyes and the, from the fibers? So um, this is a, an example of um, natural mountain goat wool. Um, and so from this, we would get a very small sample um, mailed to us. And from that, we would take an even smaller sample um, and put it into a conical vial to extract the dye. And so the conical shape acts like a lens and actually magnifies the sample. So while this is, of course, enlarged on the screen here, the actual sample is smaller than it appears because of it's not, it, um, it's, wow, <laughs> it's magnified there. Um, okay, so then from that, we want to extract um, the, the liquid itself. And then we inject it into a column. And in this column, uh, the, the chemicals, so this is a mixture of chemicals, uh, they separate out in the column. And then as they separate out, they exit the column at different points in time. And so when, then we can measure the mass or the weight of each of those components. And so then that allows us to figure out what the molecules are. Okay, so I, I wanted to show you um, this separation process, and this is a hands-on portion, so I'm going to ask for my helpers to help me pass out some samples. So if everyone can please take a Dixie cup and pour a little bit of water into... Okay. Like a, just to, yeah, a little splash. And then actually if, if um, from this side, so everyone else needs to take a, af uh, you need to take a piece uh, of filter paper and utilize one of these green pens to make a small dot. Okay, so make a small dot at the bottom of the filter paper. And then when you have your dot on the filter paper, then put it into the water and make sure that the water doesn't touch the dot. Make sure that the water just touches the, the paper below the dot, okay? And hold it in there uh, for, for two minutes or so and watch what you see. 
Okay, I'm going to start another. There's a pen and maybe Liana, would you mind sh separating? Yeah. Let's put Thank you. Yes, I think I think the water is up. Oh no! Put the water at the put the water at the close end to where the dot is. So close. So you would dunk it in this way. You get there. No, yeah, try, try not to allow the water to come above the dot. Okay, so just, yeah, just below the dot. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the papers with the green pens are coming around. So just to show you, <laughs> the dot cannot touch the water. That's right. So, so you want the water. So you want the water to soak up past the dot. Okay. So you put the paper in the water and hold it there. You don't want the dot to go under the level of the water, and hold it there for a couple of minutes while the water soaks up onto the paper. Hold it in there, yeah. So in this in this demonstration, the paper the, the paper is called the stationary phase and the water is called the mobile phase. And what we're seeing here is, does the dye like to be in the stationary phase or in the mobile phase? And are there different components in the dye that prefer to be in the stationary phase or the mobile phase? So as this is happening, does anyone see differences in color? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, let me see what you're saying. Yes, very good. Okay, so th that's a great That's a great. Okay, so so do you see do you see that the yellow yeah. likes to be in the stationary phase the p with the paper more than the blue does? The blue likes to be in the mobile phase more? Yeah. Oh yes, is that, is that that's a good one. There's this um, actually her, hers is maybe even more clear with the yellow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's, <laughs> so hopefully you saw what I wanted you to see. Okay, so that is called chromatography. What you just did is chromatography. So you're separating out the dye components. And so what you can see with that green pen is that in fact, that green pen is composed of a yellow dye and a blue dye mixed together. And you determined that by chromatography. So in my lab, what we do is we first do chromatography to separate out the dye components. And then we would do the equivalent of leaving that paper strip into the, into the cup for a long time so that the yellow, or first the blue, would come all the way off the end of it, and then the yellow would as well. 
And then when it comes off the end, it's swept up into another instrument called a mass spectrometer. And the mass spectrometer does something that I'll call the molecular crash test. And so it takes the molecules, and so let's say this is the blue dye, the, mo the molecule for the blue dye coming off first. Okay, so we know that the, that blue dye traveled quickly, right? It'd like to be in the, the mobile phase. And so it comes off, and then it goes through, through um, an electron beam sometimes. Um, there, there are some options here, but it goes through an electron beam, and that breaks up the whole molecule into pieces. And then those pieces go through a very large magnetic field, and when they're broken up, they don't stay as a neutral piece, they actually become ionized, which means they're charged. So they're, let's say they're positively charged. And so it's actually their mass to charge ratio that determines their trajectory in this magnetic field. And so you can see that depending on the mass of them, they spread out differently. And so the instrument can sort them very, very accurately for how much each piece weighs. And from that, we can reconstruct the weight, the mass of all of the different fragments. And any one molecule breaks apart in a very predictable and reproducible way. So we can tell what the dye components are once we build up a database with our known dyes that are provided by the, the weaving group um, to their patterns, to, to their fraction patterns um, in the mass spectrum. So we use a number of different um, instruments based on primarily this uh, basic concept. Uh, whoops. We also use an instrument uh, called X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, and that allows us to identify if there's copper present or iron present. These other uh, photographs are uh, different types of um, mass spectrometry instruments. So we can do separation-based analysis, which um, is what, what we got to do here. So chromatography is step one, and then measure the mass of the individual uh, components as they come off um, into the mass spectrometer. So we have several different instruments that um, we are evaluating. And like I said, we, we want to maximize the amount of information that we can get from the smallest sample size. So that's why we're doing evaluating um, these reference uh, sets against all of these different instruments. So we can do liquid chromatography. Oops. We can do liquid chromatography where um, our mobile phase is a liquid, just like you did with water. Or we can do gas chromatography where our mobile phase is a gas. Uh, and then we can also use a, a neat technique called pyrolysis gas chromatography where we actually burn the sample. And so we put the little piece of wool into a quartz tube and put that in a, in a furnace and heat it up to about 600 degrees Celsius. And then as it's burning, the vapors from that then travel into the column, which is our stationary phase, and then are swept into the mass spectrometer. So we burn it, and we separate all the components, and then we measure their masses individually. And we have options, instrumental options, that don't require the chromatography step either. So we could put the whole dye extract, the, the green marker extract, for example, into the mass spectrometer and uh, see if we can determine um, the identity of the dye without separation. Um, and this is a, a fairly new technique. It's called um, direct analysis in real time at mass spectrometry. And you can actually hold a sample, so you can actually hold a piece of wool right in front of um, this orifice. And there's a, um, an ion beam that's traveling in this path. And so without extracting any dye itself, you can potentially analyze what the dye components are. So we want to evaluate what the best technique is going to be for these dyes. And so the, the question of, what are the dyes is a relatively simple one, but the scientific process for determining how best to analyze them isn't so simple, and it is taking um, months to do this. So I'm sorry about the lack of um, conclusive information at present, but we're trying our best to um, 
be scrupulous in our analysis to um, once we have established the methodology, then to analyze the data and uh, not provide incorrect information. So, um, so when we the output from gas chromatography mass spectrometry, just for example, uh, looks like this. So there's two uh, primary data data sets. So there's the chromatogram, which is essentially what you um, would produce from uh, this kind of analysis, where down here would be time. And so with time, this would be in minutes. Um, as you wait, then you see one color coming off and another color and another color. And so the instrument is able to measure the intensity of those colors as they're being um, produced off. And then at each point in time, as molecules are coming off the end of the column, then they're being introduced or swept into the mass spectrometer, and you're getting a mass spectrum. So at any, any one of these slices, so at this slice in time, you could say um, this is the mass spectrum that's produced, OK? And so this is actually the scan at 13.6 uh, uh, minutes, so right in here, this peak in our chromatogram, the corresponding mass spectrum for that. So there's a lot of information that's produced. Each, each one of these peaks produces a mass spectrum like this. And this is the fragment. That, so after the molecules break up, these are the masses, the mass to charge ratios of those little pieces. And this is the pattern that each molecule gives us. Each of the dye components gives us this characteristic pattern. So we use this pattern to identify what the components are. Um, so for example, um, undyed merino wool um, gives us uh, this chromatogram. And so you can see that there are some very large peaks that come off of the undyed wool. And this is interesting. So what are those um, peaks from a molecular perspective? So one of those large peaks is a palmitic acid. Another is a steric acid. And then another is cholesterol. And so there's a very large background signal in these dyed samples as well. And those come from uh, the fact that these wools uh, have been scoured with um, scouring agents, so Fels naphtha, and that contains both palmitic and lauric acids. And so the scouring agent might be the source of this. Um, of course, we know that these wools are also handled, and uh, human skin exudes uh, some of those uh, fatty acids, uh, also lotions, hand creams, and things like that. So these are not um, sterile samples, right? These are, these are samples that have been out in the world. But this also complicates the analysis, because there's a lot of other stuff in there, too. So we get the uh, data, and we can compare those patterns of molecules against a database. And so this is a database um, that is available um, for purchase um, th through the National Institute for Standards and Technology, that's NIST. And so we can identify what the molecules are if they're in the NIST database. And as I said, from the uh, weavers' samples, we can also build our own database. Uh, and, and then when we have unknown samples, we can search against that database. And so that is very helpful, because the matrix that we're working with, the fact that these are uh, merino wools or mountain goat wools, and they've been handled by a lot of different people, gives a very high background matrix, that palmitic acid, that cholesterol, um, steric acid many other um, components as well. So that background matrix affects what we see compared to the standard NIST database. And so, um, so that, that's another reason why it's really important for us to have our own reference set of samples um, to compare against. Oops. OK, so our next steps are to complete our analysis of our reference materials. Um, from there, we'll determine the best procedural methodology to maximize this sample information. Um, analyze robe samples, and uh, co-write up results for peer review and present findings at celebration in June of 2020, and uh, provide information or co-develop um, exhibition materials um, for, it sounds like that exhibition is opening next summer, which is exciting to hear. Okay, and I'd like to 
acknowledge again um, the Alaska State Museums and the Chilkat um, Dye Working Group and thank all of you for your attention. And if there are any questions. Is it still on? Okay. I read someplace or heard someplace that Vivianite is a um, material that some people think is the source of the blue, early blue. Can you can you speak to that, please? Thank you. So um, yeah, so Vivianite is an iron phosphate mineral. And uh, Vivianite has, um, well, in Oregon, and I, and I think this is true in Alaska also, uh, the pine cones of some trees, when they get buried in sediment um, by the seaside, by the shore, uh, then they oxidize in a very anaerobic environment and actually produce Vivianite. And so you can find, you can go to the, in Oregon, you can go to the shore at low tide and dig out these pine cones. Initially, they're white when you see them and you hold them in air and they turn blue before your eyes. And it's pretty amazing to see. Um, so Vivianite is a, is a, is a mineral, um, like a rock, a stone. And so it doesn't stick very well uh, to wool fiber. So I think it's, I think it's less likely, but that's, I have heard a lot of people talk about Vivianite, and so that's on my mind. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the presentation and for the work. I was just wondering, um, when you give this um, final report, um, what is the result that you're, uh, what's the product? Will it be like um, recipes? Will it be, um, you know, just an analysis of the the, the robes from the past and and just saying um, what particles will be. I guess I'm just trying to figure to what extent can this be usable for all of us here. Thank you. So I don't know how precise it will be in terms of recipes, um, but what I hope it will say is, it, does the yellow come from yarrow or does it come from wolf moss or goldenrod? or does the blue come from copper or indigo? And then as far as the tone, the, the depth of color, that depends on, on many things, on the concentration of the dye bath and on the duration of time in the dye bath. And so I may not be able to provide that level of detail, of course, because these dyes have uh, faded over time too. And so the color that is there now may not have been the color that was there originally, too. So that's another complication. But at least I think it will say what these dye components are. And then from that, the weavers could take that knowledge. And if, if they would like to try to reproduce that color, then they would know the starting point. And there would still be some experimentation. But I think that's part of the joy of dyeing and weaving. <laughs> Additionally, I think that we're excited as a weavers group to be able to say, oh, this, like Liana said early in the in the talk, that um, we could say, oh, this one was made with wolf moss. Well, there's these three other robes that were also made of wolf moss. Do you think they were in like a weaving family or weaving lineage, something like that, so we can kind of trace our own ancestry or makers back in time? Thank you so much. I think your presentation was just really beautiful, combining you guys and then the science, which is just really just exceptional, and the ethical statement as well. I just really, really like this work. It's fantastic, and I look forward to the results. Um, I just have one question following a little bit of what Lily mentioned. I'm just thinking about the weaver signatures, and if you probably have that on your mind, and are you imagining that this could actually take you to you know, individuals, to families, to clans. A couple of you mentioned that maybe you could track back to a clan. Um, and I just work with the old textiles in museums, and I know that so often the documentation is just not there. You know, it just says, like, chill cat blankets. So thank you again.
I guess I'll just bring up that um, Zachary Jones here at the archives here um, in the APK Museum has done a lot of work, like lots and lots of lots and lots of work on signatures for weavers and that there are multiples that have the same signature but are like span over 150 years or something. So there's, there's he's, he's not sure that that signature is reliable as a single weaver and that there may have been like this teacher and then the student has the same signature and then her student has the same signature so we're we're looking at that but yes it would be very interesting to see if some of the similar dyes come from those same like the zigzaggy pattern one for, of the the signature on that particular robe would it have similar dyes over 150 years that would be really cool to see we're, uh, a couple naturalists sitting in the back of the room are scratching our heads trying to figure out what wolf moss is so, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so wolf moss is, uh, I had a picture of it. It's that, let me point it out because it's, oh, there it is. It's a funny thing. Um, here, this is wolf moss. Um, it's a neon yellowy green moss that grows on uh, Sitka spruce trees. And I don't think that it grows here. I think it's further south. So it definitely is on the Oregon coast. And I don't know... I don't know its range and if its range range has changed, but if you have more thoughts on that, please. We call it Letharia vulpina or Vulpiria, uh, vul, yes, Letharia vulpina. We do not get it here. We have to go either inland to Yukon Territory, or British Columbia, or south to Oregon, but the Cascade Mountain Range has epic amounts of wolf moss. And you know why, what? East of the Cascades, right. So, so, um, but we call it wolf moss because the this the folklore goes you can crumble this particular lichen on a piece of meat and the wolves will come and eat it and die. So if it so it's a lichen, and uh, would it have been used by Chilkat weavers in in trade rather than gathering it locally? Is that the idea? That's correct. That's what we understand, is that we would be trading it and then using it as our dye source. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, I teach Tlingit language. Um, my name is Marcia. And one of my students was from another state. And he went through my class, and I share about my weaving also. And um, after he had left, he's, he's graduated, I get this little box in the mail, and I opened it. I didn't even know who it was from. I looked at it for a while. But um, there was wolf moss in it. His grandmother had gathered it for me on, from Washington. So um, from what I understand, it's on the east side of the mountain range. And they got it from up the Chilkoot Trail around Bennett on down on that side. So. You know, when Alan first explained this whole process to us, we were all sitting in the same room, and we were like. <laughs> and so over time, she explained again and again. And pretty soon, we were going, yeah, we're going to be able to say this all in Tlingit and Haida and Simshian. Soon, we're going to be able to explain it. But in reality, what it coaxed us and encouraged us into doing is to creating the ceremony. And because the little pieces are going off, to wherever they're going to go. But through the process, they're going to be destroyed. And so for many of us who weave, I don't know about you, but I don't even throw away the little bits and pieces that I have. I keep them because they're very precious to me, and I even give them out as gifts. You know, it gives you strength if I give you this piece and you can tie it around your finger and carry it with you and you place it someplace that's very precious. And so when we learned about this, we knew that it was very important that we had to send it off. And so that's why, again, we, we went through the singing and the storytelling, and we introduced ourselves, and we treated it with every respect that we could, could come up with. 
as we prepared to send off the little packages off to the, the places where they were being studied. Finished, Jeesh, thank you.